Today on the Vantage Point, we're taking a look at five American product innovations that rocked the world. Let's start off with blue jeans. According to a 2012 article in the BBC magazine, and I quote, the classic symbol of the American West is now a stable of wardrobes around the world. End of quote. In America, the name blue jeans is as synonymous with casual Fridays in the office as it is on the rodeo circuit. Would you believe that jeans were named after Genoa, Italy, where in the mid-1800s cotton corduroy was fabricated into a material that was conveniently called jean? That material, however, did not make blue jeans. In 1851, a German fellow named Levi Strauss moved to New York where he helped his brother run a dry goods business. With a gold rush drawing tens of thousands of miners to California, Levi set off for San Francisco in 1853, where he hoped to open a second family dry goods store on the West Coast. Among the items he sold was cotton cloth, or denim. One of Levi's customers was Jacob W. Davis, a tent and canvas maker headquartered in Reno, Nevada. One day, a customer came into Mr. Davis's store and asked for sturdy work pants that would resist splitting at the pockets and flies. To meet his customer's wishes, Jacob ordered denim from Levi and fashioned pants out of that material. To add strength to the fly and pockets, Jacob used copper rivets to hold the material in place. The pants proved to be durable and were a hit with a number of Davis's customers. Davis then asked Levi Strauss to help him patent the product. In 1873, the two men became partners and opened a larger factory. Blue jeans were born. Today, according to anthropologist Danny Miller, almost half of the world's population, and I quote, from the Philippines to Turkey, India and Brazil, end of quote, wear blue jeans on a regular basis. When talking about the earliest inventor of an engineered form of non-fire lighting, we'd have to point to a Cornish chemist named Humphrey Davy, who in 1802 used wires to connect a battery to a piece of carbon. Lo and behold, the carbon glowed. He called his invention the arc lamp, but its glow did not last very long, so it did not become commercially viable. In 1840, British scientist Warren de la Rue placed a platinum coil inside of a vacuum tube and ran an electrical current through it. It glowed! LaRue's bulb was efficient, but the high cost of platinum made it commercially impractical. Another early inventor of a kind of light bulb was an English physicist named Joseph Wilson Swan. In 1860, Swan had a working prototype, but he continued to refine his light bulb throughout the 1870s. However, it never really became viable because of an inadequate vacuum and an unreliable source for electricity. Closer to the United States in 1874, two Canadians named Henry Woodward and Matthew Evans filed a patent for a light bulb in Canada. Their design called for putting carbon rods between electrodes into glass cylinders filled with nitrogen. They tried to commercialize it, but they were unsuccessful. In 1879, they sold their Canadian patent to a fellow by the name of Thomas Alva Edison. Thomas Edison is often credited with the invention of the light bulb, but it is more accurate to say that he is the originator of the first commercially successful light bulb. In 1878, he filed his first patent. A year later, in 1879, he filed another patent that featured strips of carbon filament connected to platina contact wires. His bulb was still not commercially viable, though. However, several months after he filed his second patent, Edison and his team discovered that carbonized bamboo filament could last over 1,200 hours. Finally, this light bulb was marketable. Edison Light Company began operation in 1880. By 1912, electricity and light bulbs were commonplace and even made transatlantic oceanic travel more pleasant. Sadly, it also helped illuminate the sinking of the Titanic. Even the ancients dared to dream of flight. In Greek mythology, there's a story of Daedalus and his son Icarus who were held captive on the eastern Mediterranean island of Crete. 
Daedalus collected birds' feathers and wax, and with those materials he fashioned wings for himself and his son. Just before their escape from their island prison, Daedalus warned his son not to fly too close to the sun because its rays would surely melt the wax that held the feathers in place. But the temptation to explore the sky was too much for Icarus. In his revelry, he flew much higher than his father. When the wax melted under the sun's intense heat, Icarus fell to his death. While their story is mythical, there were others who went on to try, heavier than the air flight, and sadly many of them met their deaths trying to break the bondage of gravity. Kite flying in China dates back to several centuries BC. There's reason to believe that the ancient Chinese and Japanese were successful in developing and using man-carrying kites. In the 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci had dabbled in designing human-powered aircraft. By 1505, he had resolved that such an apparatus was not practical, so he turned his attention to working on designs for gliders. It's not clear, however, uh, how much different those gliders were from the earlier Chinese kites. In 1778, Frenchman Francois de Rosier and Francois Laurent became the first humans to successfully fly in a hot air balloon. A hot air balloon, of course, is lighter than air and has many limitations in navigation. The Zeppelin was designed to give pilots some control over the direction of a gas-filled or lighter-than-air ship. The first Zeppelin took flight from the shore of Lake Constance in Germany on July 2, 1900. The inaugural flight ended when the wind-up tension propeller lost its power and the Zeppelin went down in Lake Constance. Heavier-than-air flight literally took off when two Ohio brothers with a knack for mechanical innovations got interested in human flight. Wilbur Wright was born in Millville, Indiana in 1867, and his brother Orville was born in Dayton, Ohio in 1871. Their father was a bishop in the Brethren Church, so they traveled around quite a bit. The brothers also grew up sharing many interests. They honed their mechanical skills, operating their own printing press and bicycle shops. In addition to engineering their own bicycle, they branched out into gliders and then airplanes. They thought that the wind conditions were excellent at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, to fly their gliders. It was not long before the brothers wanted to add power to their glider. On December 17, 1903, Orville climbed aboard the Wright Flyer, the name they gave to their 605-pound flying machine. Its 12-horsepower motor was crafted by Charlie Taylor, the Wright brothers' shop mechanic. To keep weight down, Taylor made the engine block out of aluminum, which was unusual for the time, and used gravity to feed gasoline into the engine. December 17th was a freezing, blustery day on the Carolina beach, with a bone-chilling headwind producing gusts of up to 27 miles per hour. Orville's flight lasted for 12 seconds, climbed to 10 feet above the sandy beach, and traveled for 120 feet, with his brother trailing along beside him. Despite the headwind, the plane moved along at 6.8 miles per hour. Just 15 and a half years later, a U.S. Navy Curtis NC-4 under the command of Albert Reed made the first transatlantic flight. And a month later in June 1919, Captain John Alcock and Lieutenant Arthur Witten Brown of the United Kingdom became the first humans to fly nonstop across the Atlantic in a Vickers Vimy bomber. Their flight took only 16 hours and 12 minutes. In less than 16 years, the Wright brothers' invention made the world a much smaller place. Although there were hundreds of unsuccessful challenges to his claim as the inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell successfully landed a patent for his invention in 1876. That's the same year that the U.S. celebrated its centennial while mourning the loss of 262 members of the 7th Cavalry at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland on March 3, 1847. The young lad never distinguished himself as a stellar student, but he did have a reputation for problem solving. For example, at the age of 12, he invented a tool for a friend's father to remove husks from wheat grain. But at home, he had a tense relationship with his own dad. Despite that rocky relationship, Alexander adopted his father's interest in voice mechanics. 
Although he dropped out of high school, he eventually became a teacher for the deaf. After two of his brothers unfortunately lost their lives to tuberculosis, he joined the rest of his family in relocating from Scotland to Canada in 1870. A year later, he was in America teaching at the Boston School for Deaf Mutes. When he was 25, he married one of his students, a 15-year-old girl named Mabel Hubbard. They went on to have four children, but sadly, two sons died in infancy. Gardner Hubbard, Mabel's father and leader of a group of investors, approached Alexander to perfect a harmonic telegraph. A harmonic telegraph would permit multiple messages to travel through a telegraph line at the same time. But Alexander was more interested in perfecting voice transmission. Therefore, he negotiated a deal with the investors to receive support for both technologies. What a sharp guy. He claimed that if, and I quote, if I could make a current electricity vary in intensity precisely as the air varies in density during the production of sound, I should be able to transmit speech telegraphically, end of quote. In the end, the telegraph, or the telephone, won out over the telegraph, and he was awarded a patent for it in 1876. His logic made sense. Can you imagine the world without telephones? In 1968, Robert N. Noyce and Gordon E. Moore were doing their best to make semiconductors more practical and affordable. Through their efforts, they developed the integrated circuit. Their work made it possible for computers to become smaller and smaller. For instance, an iPhone 6 has 100,000 times more power than the computer used on the Apollo 11 voyage to the moon's tranquility base. The integrated circuit or microchip developed by Noyce and Moore made many of our modern conveniences possible. The integrated circuit was built on silicone, the second most common element in the Earth's crust. Because there was a hotel company named Moore Noyce, the physicist and engineer borrowed the first three letters from the word integrated and the first two letters from the word electronics to form Intel Corporation. Intel's location and importance to the computer industry gave birth to what has become known as Silicon Valley in California, and the world is richer for it. We would be remiss if we didn't mention that there are a few other American innovations and products that deserve honorable mention. Pepsi and Coca-Cola, soy machines, supermarkets, air conditioning, and assembly lines. These are just a few of the best received American innovations used around the world. They have made life a lot more enjoyable and prosperous for many of the world's peoples. Thanks for joining me tonight. I hope to see you again here on The Vantage Point.